The Triathlon Show 251. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview James Sprague. James is a cycling coach with uh, really great knowledge in uh, both the scientific side and the applied side of cycling and coaching. He's uh, himself a former professional cyclist and he has coached cyclists from uh, from amateurs up to Olympic level. And he has taken cyclists to over 20 medals at national, European and world championship levels. So we'll have a varied training talk today where we're talking about James' coaching philosophy, training structure, periodization, microstructures, and when and why to select different types of training and profiling an athlete and so on, much, much more. But uh, we'll, you'll hear about that when we get into the interview, which we'll do right after thanking our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. They make electrolyte supplements that you can match to your individual uh, sodium losses. So your, how much sodium you lose in your sweat depends on your sweat rate and your sweat sodium concentration. And the best way to figure out roughly where you stand in the sweat sodium loss department is to take Precision Hydration's free online sweat test on their website. And uh, that consists of 10 questions in a quiz format, qualitative answers, multi, uh, multi-choice multi answers. So it's uh, pretty easy, it takes a few minutes, and that will give you a good ballpark estimate that has been validated with actual medical grade sweat testing equipment. Uh, so uh, definitely a great starting point for you to then go and select what sort of electrolyte supplement strength you should use in training and racing. You can also get 15% off your products with the promo code that triathlon show 15 And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world leading experts in wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And the eyewear category with the prescription glasses, sunglasses, and so on is something that has been growing substantially in the last year or so. And some really cool new things that Roka has going on in that department is uh, things like the online vision test that you can use to update your uh, prescription from the comfort of your own home. They also have uh, home try-on options for their glasses and many other things. Uh, although I should say that some of these things are only available in the United States. You can get 20% off your order of Roka products with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with coach James Sprague. Welcome to the Triathlon Show. James, how are you doing today? Yeah, good. Thanks. How about yourself? I'm good as well. Thank you. So let's start simply by you introducing yourself a bit to the audience and uh, telling us about your your background and what you're currently doing, your current role in in sports. Yeah, sure. Um, So I guess I I kind of got into cycling when I was uh, probably 13, 14, and was kind of lucky enough to be picked up by British Cycling and went through their sort of talent development um, program. Um, didn't kind of make the make the cut at, at a certain age, going into under twenty threes, and so went abroad and and have lived abroad since really. So I spent ten years um, riding my bike full time, uh, probably about six years as a professional, uh, both on the road and cross. So not at the highest level on the road, but I still kind of you know rode semi classics and and kind of some big stage races and that sort of stuff. Um, and then on cross, um, on the cross bike, competed at kind of a World Cup level. Um, so it stopped the end of my career was a, probably three years ago now. Um, and then I went on to do a master's degree, um, in sports science. Um, and now I'm back to start a PhD. Um, in terms of coaching, so I started working with some riders while I was still, um, obviously riding myself. Um, and then have moved into kind of a more coach sports science. Uh, role full time since the end of my career. All right. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me, really. Yeah, and and I was going to ask uh, the PhD that you're starting. Uh, what's uh, the the topic going to be? Um, so we're looking at 
um, the downward shift in the power duration curve in elite cyclists. Um, so essentially, virtually with the group that I work with, we've, we've just had a couple of papers accepted. Um, and one of them looked at the differences between under 23 and professional cyclists during the Tour of the Alps stage race. Um, and we also split those cyclists up into, into groups. So we had um, GC contenders, we had climbing domestiques, and we had more all-rounders. Um, and we saw quite a distinct difference between the groups in how much power they can produce after defined workloads. So we looked at their maximum powers after 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, and 3,000 kilojoules. Um, and we saw, for example, in the all-rounders group that we basically saw a downward shift in that power duration curve after each of those defined workloads. Um, however, with the GC group, we didn't see that downward shift. Uh, and there was almost no difference even after 3,000 kilojoules um, between their maximal power duration curve and, and their power duration curve kind of under fatigue, if you like. Um, so my PhD will be looking at why we see those differences between groups. All right. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. And and maybe once you have some uh, some more papers or perhaps even the entire PhD finished, we'll, we will have a, an in-depth discussion about that topic because absolutely uh, fascinating to, to hear about those things. Uh, but uh, let's move a bit more into coaching for a while here. And uh, I know this is a very broad question, but uh, if you can give an overview of your main coaching slash training principles, what, what would that be? Yeah, okay. I think you always need a good evidence base for any decisions or interventions that you're going to make with an athlete. I guess, you know, I guess you'd call it kind of evidence-informed coaching. So in order to make good decisions, you need to have as much kind of information at your fingertips as possible. And I think a bit of a, a deep dive into the relevant kind of literature is always, always a good starting point. Um, and I think understanding you know, not only the outcomes and the conclusions of these studies, but also, you know, the nuances and the caveats is a really good way to, to at least sort of build up that evidence base. Um, and then you start to get an understanding of maybe what will work with a specific athlete or the specific, specific group or what might not work or the reasons why it may or may not work. Um, and then I guess I see sort of coaching as it, it, the kind of, you know, the application of that knowledge to the individual athlete. Um, and you know what what works for them so you know if you've if you start with that good understanding you can at least make good initial decisions um and then it's a case of you know applying that to the athletes seeing what's working seeing what's not working um and you know kind of then making further decisions from there so i guess that's sort of my overall uh coaching methodology yeah. Uh, do you, off the top of your head, can you think of any sort of examples where athletes or or even coaches get this process wrong, where they're like really uh, working against the evidence-informed principles? Uh, is is there something common that comes to mind that you see a lot of time going wrong? Yeah, I think I think athletes and coaches are bombarded with a lot of information, and it's it's often the case that people sort of get a bit distracted by what what. The kind of the, you know the newest gizmo on the market or the newest study that's come out or and they, they kind of you know focus solely on that and that ends up distracting them from, from kind of doing the basics well so you know I think the basics are 99 percent of, of what you do with an athlete so you know train well sleep well and, and eat well and, and do that consistently over time that's where you're going to see the big gains and and all the best athletes get that right and only then can you kind of you know exploit things the very very margins of performance um so i think what what the biggest mistake i see people making is you know something new comes out and they focus all their energy or all their decision making or whatever else on this on this new thing and forget that you know that's that's actually a tiny tiny piece of the puzzle and you know getting those basics right of going out training every day recovering well eating well sleeping well they're the they're the things that's going to you know bring an athlete on in the longer term um and actually to be honest in the shorter term as well yeah yeah that, that's uh really great uh really great advice and i was actually planning on asking this next question uh later on but it uh, fits quite nicely in here so i'm going to ask you for athletes that are interested in learning more and and using the available science and research in their own self-coaching perhaps or for coaches budding coaches that uh, want to get into it do you have any sort of resources that you might recommend 
for them to to get started and learn about the the main the most important things the fundamentals and uh, not so much get hung up on uh, the latest shiny single study that shows something on a on an obscure topic yeah i i don't actually think there's, there's that many really good kind of single um source resources out there i think you, you know you need to collect knowledge from a wide range of areas i think uh, a good textbook to start with is um uh, it's called Endurance Training Science and Practice, I believe, by Anigo Mukica. Yeah. Um, so that's a really good kind of starting point. Um, and then I think you need to kind of immerse yourself a little bit. So things like um, there's a website called ResearchGate, um, which is really useful. So it's, you know most most people that are publishing will will put their articles on them on there, and if you contact them, they'll, they'll happily send you those articles. And then you get kind of recommended articles on top. So then you can start really kind of getting into the into the research, if that makes sense. Say, okay, I'll read this paper, and then I'll request this one from an author and read that one as well. And you get a bit of a a, a broader idea of, of the arguments and the concepts and, and where these things might be effective and where they might not be effective. Um, I think also talk to other coaches. Do you know what I mean? Talk to sports scientists. Like people, people quite enjoy telling you what they're doing and what you know what's working, what isn't particularly working well, you know, where they've seen improvements with their athletes. So I think there's a good kind of community out there that, that are certainly, you know, my experience at least is that people are quite willing to share kind of their insights. Um, you know, blogs can be, can be quite good, uh, you know, sort of webinars, um, all, all sorts of things can be, can be really good resources. But I think you just don't need to hang your hat too much on, on one particular source, if that makes sense. Try and get that, that as I say, that sort of broad um, resource base yeah, and kind of formulate your own sort of ideas from that. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I mean, as you alluded to there, I think there, there's no there's no replacing actually going in and reading the the studies and there's no one source for all the wisdom in the world i've recommended endurance training by inigo Mujica many times uh, as regular listeners will know and also research gate and but that's really where you where you will where you will learn like get to get the deep insights where where you start to read like getting the feel for the consensus on a given topic in the scientific community so so yeah it does take a lot of work but uh, but I would agree that uh, endurance training is a great starting point and talking to coaches. I think Twitter is another great. That's how I found you, actually. And you uh, post some really good, interesting stuff on Twitter. So if you follow the right people on Twitter, which is perhaps easier said than done, then then you can get a lot of use out of Twitter as well. Yeah, certainly. And I, I think then, you know, once you've got that evidence base, there's, you know, you kind of need to get your, your hands dirty, so to speak, and actually, you know, try and apply some of that stuff with, with athletes um, because it's, it, it's all very well having all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't apply that knowledge and, and have that knowledge be effective, then, then, then kind of what, you know, what use is it? Um, so, you know, get out there and, and, you know, talk to athletes and say, okay, this is, you know, this is kind of what I've read and this is what kind of the consensus needs to be, you know, shall we try this, you know, and have that conversation with your athletes um, and get a feel for how you can apply that sort of knowledge. I think yeah. that, that, that's also a really useful skill for, you know, kind of uh, practitioners sports scientists coaches to have yeah totally so uh let's uh, talk a little bit about training structure uh what what are your thoughts around training structure and uh, you can tackle this uh, whether you want to start from the macro level with more high level periodization or even micro uh, micro cycle structure is up to you but uh, perhaps uh, tackle each of those uh, and uh, give your take-home messages on on training structure Okay. Um, I think quite often people dive in a bit too soon. When so, let's say that you know they start with a new athlete, um, and it, it's quite easy to start. You know, you really want to get cracking, and you really want to you know help this athlete improve. And and I think sometimes it's good at the start just to take a little bit of a step back and go, okay, you know, what is this athlete's goals to start off with? You know, what's what's motivating them? What events are they kind of working up to? And, you know, what does it take to win is, is, you know, in those events or what does it take to perform in those events? Have a look at that first of all and go, okay, like these are the, you know, characteristics of this event. These are the, you know, key performance indicators. These are the things that, you know, we need to be looking at. Um, and then do the same with the, with the athlete and assess them, you know, get some kind of baseline assessment based on those, you know, key performance indicators and say, okay, like what should, you know, might be endurance, it might be 
critical power, it might be W prime, whatever it is for that specific event. Go, okay, where are we to start with? Um, and at that point, you've, you've got a good idea of, of kind of the gap you need to close, if that makes sense. You've got, okay, this is the date of this event. This is where my athlete is at the moment. How can I best close that, close that gap? Um, and sometimes you're looking at relatively short time frames, you know, across the season. Other times you can actually be looking at really long time frames, like an Olympic cycle, for example. Um, or, you know, even developing an athlete longer term if you're working with very young athletes. Um, I think that, that's a really good starting point. So that kind of profiling of both the event and the athlete itself. Um, and then in terms of kind of periodization, you'll automatically normally have some structure. So, you know, there'll be lead up events, there'll be qualification events, whatever there might be for that athlete, you know, and there'll be goalposts on the way that that athlete has to perform that in order to be selected for or, or you know, to be, in order to get ready for their, for their kind of goal event. So that's automatically kind of giving you some, some structure within that. Um, and so you've got this kind of structure, you've got an idea of where you need to work. And I don't think there's any harm, or I actually think it's something you should be looking for as a coach, like where's that? low hanging fruit if that makes sense in terms of where can i have the biggest impact with this athlete by doing the least amount with them so that might be with their sleep it might be the recovery it might be their training it might be their general life whatever that is you know pick those things off first if that makes sense and say okay this is you know the, the sort of lightest touch approach but it's going to have have the biggest effect um and once you've kind of you know got the low hanging fruit then you can start to look at specific kind of you know however you want to work with the athlete, if you want to, you know, block periodize, if you want to uh, be more general in your periodization, et cetera, you know, you can see what's worked with that athlete, what has previously worked with that athlete, you know, what do they respond well to, what do they feel comfortable with, all those things, and you can start to start to kind of build up a picture um, and an idea of, of how you're going to go forward and, and come up with a plan. I don't think we should be slotting athletes into our own particular plans. I think we should be customizing the plans and the way we work as coaches to the individual athlete. And, and how do you, can you give an example of uh, maybe an, ex, uh, an athlete that you work with or have worked with where you sort of how you come up with uh, for the given profile that they have and the goals they have, uh, how does that then turn into some sort of, if you can make it, just make it a bit more specific, I guess. Yeah, to, to yeah. yeah sure, because I realize that's a little bit abstract. So uh, a writer I work with, so, um, and I can, I can name her, Lydia Boylan. She's a, uh, a track cyclist. Uh, I've worked with Lydia for ooh, probably eight years now, something like that. Um, so she's obviously targeting the uh, she's targeting the Madison event at the um, Olympics. So we did a lot of work around what does the Madison event look like? What are the power requirements? What are the speed requirements? What are the tactical requirements? What are the psychological requirements? And we've built up. Uh, we use a program called Goalscape, and we ha we have a um, essentially a map of what performance looks like in a Madison event through all these different, you know, through these different areas. Um, then we did some profiling with her. So what sort of power outputs can she sustain for those periods of time? Obviously, the Madison is a very stochastic um, event. So, you know, you go hard and you can recover when you're not in the race and then go hard again. So is she capable of doing that? You know, what does, what does the fastest lap look like? What does an easy turn look like? What sort of speeds are we looking at? If, you know, if she's trying to take a turn, what does that involve for gearing? Um, all those sorts of things. And then, you know, we had an idea of, okay, these are the requirements for what we think is, you know, kind of a, a very good Madison performance. And this is where we are now. And so, you know, we looked at some things and the track events that are so quick nowadays that, you know, power and speed, you know, the female athletes in a, in a track event are, you know, doing a north of 60 kilometers an hour in, in their, you know, in their races um in in the fastest laps so straight away that that means basically you've, you've got to be on a big enough gear to be able to you know turn your legs fast enough and go fast enough to meet that speed re requirement once you realize the size of the gearing that you know track riders are riding nowadays then you realize there's, there's a massive strength component to that because if you've got to get that gear going each time yes you obviously you can drop down the track and get thrown in but there's still an effort required and you've got to be able to turn that gear at you know, at the slower end of the spectrum in terms of speeds in the race. So straight away that feeds into, okay, we need to get stronger. Do you know what I mean? And we need to get stronger in order to be able to, um, you know, push that gear. So that's why you've taken a, a kind of bigger picture. This is the event. This is where my athlete's at. 
you've and then you've kind of you know gone straight down to okay here's a strength and conditioning intervention that we need to do with this athlete because we know it's directly going to help performance come come race day yeah and and if you have like you have identified a gap through that sort of profiling process what would you typically do you have any preference for like how to work on that so in this case maybe strength and conditioning and uh, i guess you're referring to a lot of work in the gym but maybe you also have on bike strength work that you're including there would you more tend to work on on that in shorter sort of like basically spread out the work on different different gaps that may be identified or do you like a more block periodized approach you mentioned already that you kind of look a bit at what the athlete has responded well to in the in the past but what, is there something that's, that is typical for you in this regard yeah i think depending on how far away you are from a um, from an event so if you've got a very short timeline I think my starting point would be a, a kind of a block periodization. So let's do some specific work on that and let's see how that athlete responds. Do they respond really quickly to that or are they not responding very well to that? And then we've got an idea of, of how much work we need to do, um, you know, in a sh- relatively short period of time to get them ready for that event. If we've got longer timelines, I would probably introduce it in the other way. So I'd introduce it alongside some other training um, and again, see how that athlete responds. Um, so what you're trying to do, I think, as a coach always, is you're trying to build up a picture of, okay, how is this athlete responding, you know, and, and using that information kind of feeding forward into, into your next decisions. So I actually have like a little notebook when I've got, you know, a kind of a page or two for each athlete. And I just make little notes based on, okay, you know, such and such responded really well to that, or actually that wasn't quite what we were expecting, or, you know, that training seemed to take a little bit longer to come through than we were expecting, or, or whatever it might be. And whenever I'm, you know, sort of looking at, you know, planning an intervention with an athlete, essentially I, I go back to that notebook first of all and go, okay, well, they responded to this well last time, then, okay, we can use that or mm, we have to be a bit careful with this or, you know, they don't respond to travel as well, whatever it might be, and kind of, you know, feed that into my decision making. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, I really like that. Uh, that's, uh, that's a really good, good sort of process to have. And uh then if we move down to sort of a micro perspective and talking about micro cycles, uh, do you have uh, any philosophy around how you structure the weekly, which might be typical, but maybe you don't use a weekly micro cycle or maybe it depends. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we, I guess the, the one rule I try and follow is putting the thing that's most important first. Um, so, you know, you might have a, a, a micro cycle can, can vary in length, depend on, you know, how much time you've got or, or restrictions or travel, whatever it might be. But, um, I, I generally put whatever's most important first. So if we're trying to build endurance, then the endurance work comes first. If we're trying to build a specific, um, you know, uh, strength or gym work or whatever it might be, then, then that, then that comes first in the micro cycle. Um, I think with, with strength and condition, especially, it's quite difficult to, to, sort of program that in um, and you obviously have to be quite careful with crossover effects so obviously if you're doing endurance or if you're doing uh, sort of uh, more kind of what you traditionally call vo2 max intervals that might interfere with with the strength and conditioning in, in different ways and vice versa um, so you have to be quite careful when you build these kind of micro cycles to make sure there's no kind of interference effects and generally that's why putting the most important thing first is okay, then it's out the way of anything else that might interfere with it, you know, focus on that and then we can do other things around that. And uh, does this assume that the thing, you, the, thing, the thing you do first is also the thing that you're going to be the freshest for? So you assume that the start of the microcycle is when you're fresh or uh, is that just me reading into things? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So that, you know, okay. fo- focus is there, athletes aren't fatigued, you know, there's no interference from kind of any other stresses, hopefully. Um, and we can really focus on that and see how the athletes respond to, to that stimulus. Yeah, yeah. And and what do you think around, for example, a recovery between hard workouts? Do you have any rules of thumb that you follow that one day of recovery, maybe two days for specific really hard workouts? Or do you like to stack uh, hard workouts back to back sometimes? Uh, can you elaborate on, on those sorts of things? Yeah, it depends on the athlete a bit. So we'll... Essentially, that, all those questions come down to you know, answering all those questions come down to monitoring the athlete. So 
oh, one thing I have my athletes do is we have a, essentially a, a modified POMS questionnaire, which is point of mood state. Um, so we have, I think, eight questions that athletes feed back to me on a daily basis on just a scale of one to 10. So I've always got an idea of, okay, how's the athlete feeling? You know, how sore are they? How motivated are they? How stressed are they? Those sorts of things. Um, and talking to your athletes, you know, how did that session feel? How, you know, how were the legs? Getting a feel of, of what's going on there. Um, and then you can make those decisions and say, okay, like that, this athlete deals really well with two hard days back to back, or this athlete prefers one day and then an easy day and then another hard day or whatever it might be. Likewise, with recovery between blocks, I try not to guess too much. So one thing I do with athletes is I have them in a recovery block. So let's say they've been away on a team training camp or they've just done a stage race. What I might do is give them a you know rest day afterwards. And then from then onwards, I'll ask them to ride for five minutes at five out of 10 or six out of 10 RPE and record their power and heart rate. Don't look at them while they're riding, just ride to feel. And let's look at their heart rate and, and power response to that. And what you'll generally see if you take a ratio of those two things is you see an increasing, you know, increasing performance as they recover through through a recovery period. And then once you start to see a plateau in that response, then you know, okay, that athlete's now recovered as much as they're going to recover on their own, and it's time to introduce a new stimulus. So I try and be guided by how that athlete's responding rather than making a guess of they're going to need two days or three days or whatever it might be. Oh, that, that's a, a really, really good tip. I really like that, and I might start using it myself because, yeah, as I said, really enjoy that. Um, so next, let's uh, discuss a little bit uh, around uh, deciding what type of training. You already mentioned or talked quite a bit about this, to be honest, with the profiling and uh, the gap analysis and so on. But uh, if we dig a bit deeper into that, perhaps you can just discuss the pro or like when to use different training methods or modalities such as uh, quote unquote base training, moderate training, sweet spot training, threshold training, high intensity interval training, uh, different cadence variations, high cadence, low, you know, low cadence, high torque, uh, so on. Uh, what, 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 and when should we use? Okay, um, I think probably volume is is for most endurance athletes at least. You know the underpinning of of most uh, you know of performance essentially. So volume of training seems to increase you know capillarization is, is probably the main thing you're looking at um capillary density in the muscles uh and if you go back to the research then you, you know that's probably the biggest differentiator between athletes in terms of critical power threshold power or whatever you want to call that um so there's a great paper out of Loughborough that i just showed that differences in capillarization of the slow twitch muscle fibers accounts for 97 percent of variation in critical power which is you know is huge in terms of biology um so you know that general conditioning is probably your, your, your good start point so you want you know athletes to be fit you want them to be strong in terms of snc off the bike work general conditioning that you know you need an athlete at a certain level before you can start doing any sort of fancy interventions with them so that's always kind of the starting point is an athlete fit healthy strong you know and have good endurance okay well, once we've got that then we can kind of work on some more specific stuff um, I think in terms of, if you imagine a, a spectrum between quite a generic sort of interval training and very specific interval training, I think essentially what I try and do is move along that spectrum as we get closer to an event. So um, early on in a, in a training block, it might just be about, you know, accumulating time of critical path and however we best do that, you know, just to get that stimulus of the high intensity work. As we move towards a you know uh, a racing block or a specific event, then you know those those efforts will be more tailored to be almost a replication of what we're doing, you know what that athlete's going to have to do in that event. Um, so a great example, if I go back to the Madison example I used earlier, you know if we're a few months out from the season, it might just be okay getting that high end intensity stimulus, um, you know time above critical power, for example. As we get closer to the Madison. Then, you know, an average Madison turns about 40 seconds. So, you know, we might be doing like 40 on 40 offs, for example. Uh, and I think that's both helpful in terms of a physiology, physiology point of view, but also in terms of a mental, uh, psychological point of view for the athlete, because they kind of know how that, you know, know how that effort's going to feel come, come sort of race day. Yeah, perfect. And, and what about what's the role of uh, 
moderate intensity training, things like tempo training, threshold training even, and sweet spot training, whatever you want to call them, however you want to categorize them, uh, how, where do you see that fitting in? Um, I, I guess I, I, my, my starting point is, is always go for a more polarized approach. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of kind of zone two, zone, you know, base work, if that makes sense, and moderate intensity exercise, and then, and then a, a small percentage of a very high intensity, severe domain intensity exercise. I think that, that moderate domain, so that, you, you know, you'd call it the heavy, heavy domain heavy, so between the two. Domain, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, it can be useful for certain events. So, you know, if you've got like an, an Ironman athlete, for example, that's where they're going to spend their race time. So you can't, you know, it might be in your, um, more preparatory box. So further away from the event, you know, you use that polarized system, but then obviously, you know, just to get them used to the, um, used to the event, you might want to spend more time in that, in that heavy domain, or you might want to do kind of race replications where they spend time in that, in that, in that domain. So I, I think it can be useful. I think, um, you need to see a little bit like how athletes respond, if they respond well to that sort of work or not. And um, I think my starting point is always kind of a, a polarized approach because that, you know, the the relevant research says that that's probably the way to go. Um, but I don't think we need to be too dogmatic in, in our in our training, if that makes sense. Um, because yeah. it's more about how the athlete responds, you know what I mean, rather than what scientific literature happens to say yeah of course and and that makes makes a lot of sense you're doing the specific training with for example an ironman athlete or half ironman athlete or uh you, you do that closer to the event so um, i mean you you need to do that whether that means that you're doing reverse periodization or not that's an, a different discussion i think but uh, but it does make sense and i totally agree that before the race you need to do some race specific work um in terms of uh the what you mentioned there about the endurance training uh, being the and the base training being the foundation of of everything and you, you need to basically uh, nail that component before you get fancy uh, one thing that i wanted to ask about is in ter- for time crunched amateur athletes that have a limited time to train uh, what's your take on replacing some of the endurance training with more high intensity and moderate intensity or heavy and severe domain training uh, because that's something that I think is quite prevalent, and uh, yeah, we just want to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I, I think it's a tr- it's always it, you know that's a tricky question. I think it can work, especially in the short term. So you know, if you're looking at like periods of let's say ten to twelve weeks or a few months, then it can certainly work in terms of you just ramping up the intensity, doing more of that sort of stuff. Um, in the longer term. I'm not so sure how well that works. So I think without that, without that kind of base volume, it's, it's very difficult to to see those sort of long-term year-on-year kind of improvements. So I think what you see with a lot of athletes is, you know, you can you can kind of get them to a, a really good point in, in let's say 10 to 12 weeks with a lot of high-intensity work, and then after that, it's, it's very difficult to carry on those those sort of gains. Um, but you, you are where you are with those athletes. You know what I mean? They, they have a full-time job. They have busy families, whatever else. So you kind of have to, have to make the best of, of, of what time they have available. Um, something that has kind of worked well for me with athletes in the past is saying to them, okay, look, it is what it is. Like, this is the time you've got available. We'll use that as best we can. It, it probably is, you know, pushing things into, you know, do more high intensity work. However, is there a point where we can actually, you know, do some real volume? So maybe even if it's a week or if it's four days across a weekend, you know, a long weekend or whatever it might be, can we block that aside? And, you know, can you fit that into your schedule to be, to take those four days and we'll just do a volume block in those four days? Um, so, you know, with time crunched athletes or age groupers, then, you know, you need to work around their daily lives because obviously they can't, you know, they can't change those things um, and do the best you can with, with what you have available really. Yeah, perfect. And uh, coming back a bit to the profiling and uh, the gap analysis, how do you? What different w- ways or methods do you use to to assess that, that their profiles and uh, the gaps that may exist? Do you tend to use field tests, different metabolic tests, uh, performance tests, or what? Yeah, what different tools do you have in your toolbox there? Yeah, generally I, I go to as field testing, um, just because I work with most of my athletes remotely um 
And so, you know, we will always will do a field test, even if we can do more. So if we can get them in the lab to do some more specific testing, then, then we'll always still do a field test. So we've got a baseline value for, for any future tests that we do down the line if, you know, we can't get them back to the lab or whatever, if they're away at training camps. So we'll always do some field testing. Um, generally, that's a critical power test that I do with athletes. Um, we will also uh, do a, we have a, to, together with um, a guy called Tim Podlegar, who's a nutritionist that I work with, we've, we've come up with a nutritional questionnaire that we send to athletes um, to see, you know, how well they understand what they need to do after training, in training, all that sort of thing, before training, obviously, as well. Um, so we have that. We have a sleep questionnaire to see how they're recovering off the bike, if they're nap using naps, how well they're sleeping, that sort of thing. Um, together with... Um, a woman called Josie Perry, who's a sports psychologist. We've actually come up with, uh, she's come up with a, what we call a TOPS assessment. So a tools of performance strategies. So essentially that's looking at how well people can control their motivation, control their emotions in both kind of training and in racing. And we use that to uh, essentially do some kind of sports psychology interventions with them. Um, and then we have an, uh, an S and C um, kind of core body weight assessment tool as well that we use. Um, so we get quite even just some kind of field testing. So that's all that's without getting athletes to the lab. We get a good kind of 360 picture of, of what's going on with each athlete and where those, you know, that low hanging fruit is, if that makes sense. So you might have an athlete that's performing brilliantly in training. You know, they're really strong numbers. They're sleeping well. They're recovering well. But if they can't hold it together on, on race day uh, and then let their emotions get the best of them then they're just not going to perform. And it's like, okay, well, actually, we just need to keep doing what you're doing with the rest and then focus our energy on on kind of, you know, maybe some kind of sports psychology interventions. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's our, in inverted commas, our basic profiling, if that makes sense. Um, and then if we can, if we do more, um, we will actually do some lab testing. So we can get that, uh, you know, one of the things we struggle to do in the field is, is get a feel for where the... Um, the border between moderate and heavy intensity domain is. Um, so we'll do some, you know, kind of lab testing to do that. We'll maybe look at uh, efficiency in the lab. Um, so that's something that, you know, you, you don't pick out from field testing. Uh, and also we've done a lot of wind tunnel testing with, with athletes uh, to get an idea of, you know, wind tunnel and, and biomechanics combined actually um, to get an idea of how well they're functioning on the bike and how, you know, how that's affecting their aerodynamic profile. Yeah, that's a, a great, great overview. And uh, in terms of the critical power test, uh, a couple of follow-ups on that. What durations do you tend to prefer there for for that test? And and also, can you uh, can you explain why you prefer the critical power test above some other common tests that might be, for example, just a twenty-minute TT? And uh, yeah, what, why you prefer the critical power test? Yeah, sure. So I use um, uh, a, a a protocol that was developed by the guys at the EIS um, for use of British Cycling, which is basically a warm-up, a three-minute time trial where people try and put out as much power as they can within that three minutes. Then we have 30 minutes of break where riders actually get off their bikes. We have 10 minutes re-warming up and then a 12-minute effort um, at the end. And we use that to derive both critical power and, and W prime. Um, where I think that has advantages over, let's say, you know, a traditional 20-minute test is that we, we don't know from a 20 minute test kind of where that you know where that threshold is people obviously take 95 percent of that but that's just a guess and it's in population average potentially so with a critical power test we have obviously two components that we get out of that test critical power and w prime so whenever we do a training intervention with an athlete we know that okay if we measure again we've got two measures so we can see has there been an increase in critical power or has there been an increase in w prime or you know We've got two measures to, to kind of assess them by. If we just do a, a 20 minute test, all we're taking is a 20 minute power and seeing if that's improving. And so if you take, for example, uh, track events, so let's look at um, scratch race on the track. Actually, for elite athletes, a scratch race is a pretty easy race until about five laps to go. Um, you know, generally, especially, you know, it doesn't tend to be too aggressive, and even if it is, the, the power requirements are relatively low. So an event like that, W prime is a major kind of key performance indicator because they need that, you know, five lap, six lap, whatever it is, power available to them. Um, and so if we just did a traditional 20 minute test, we might not see, you know, we might be improving their 
critical power or their threshold. But actually we then, you know, in thinking that we're on the right track, but we might actually be missing the one thing that we need to improve. Um, so that's why where I think a, a critical power test gives you more information and, and kind of more actionable um, information going forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you, you have some, you, you can be more granular with what you're actually targeting exactly, yeah. and, and how you're measuring it and, and making sure that you're actually seeing the changes that you're trying to uh, trying to induce. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So let's move on to another topic here. I want to talk a little bit about pacing and in particular here, talking about more things like time trials or steady state, fairly steady state races for uh, amateurs, things like, it could even be things like gravel races. Obviously, uh, a large part of the audience is triathletes, so it's a, a form of time trial, steady state race, that too. But there are many, many forms of steady state races where you're racing more yourself than you're following race dynamics, in, on, again, on the amateur side in particular. So uh, what uh, advice and thoughts do you have around pacing? Um, I think pacing is crucial. Pacing is, you know, pacing is actioning sort of all that work that you've done over over years and months and, and and weeks coming into the event. So if you don't get your pacing right, then you're not kind of maximizing your um, your potential. Um, obviously, you know, I think each athlete for each course needs an individual pacing strategy based on their kind of, you know, their physiology and the demands of that course. Um, I think things like, um, so obviously best bike split, um, will kind of provide that for you a little bit. And I think that's a really good starting point. Quite often it needs a bit of tweaking. So, you know, it might not quite match the physiology of the rider or the strengths and weaknesses of that rider. Um, but it's, it at least provides a really good starting point, um, about, you know, kind of conditions where you might need to push on a little bit where you can save energy and not kind of lose speed and still maximize your results. So I think pacing is about, um, delivering performance. I think one, one, other thing to mention is it needs to be practiced so you can't just expect to turn up on on race day and and get your pacing perfect do you know what i mean it needs to be practiced in training um and that's where you know in the events leading up to a, a major event or in training you, you know you need to have sessions where you're practicing that pacing and executing that pacing um and i think that's really important because come race day you probably need a little bit of flexibility in in your pacing strategy. Do you know what I mean? Conditions might not be quite how you expect, or you might be feeling slightly better or slightly worse than than you expected. And so to have that flexibility and know what to do in those circumstances and not just have this, you know, you have to do 307 watts for, you know, on this stretch of road, like what's your kind of flexibility in that pacing strategy? You can only kind of make those decisions when you've practiced that pacing and you're comfortable with that pacing, you know how you respond. So pacing something that really should be thought about quite early on um, in order to kind of get those sessions in there where you can practice it and, and, and so you can get it right on race day. Yeah. To give you an example, let's say you're preparing for a 40K TT. Uh, what would some a key workout to practice your pacing strategy be leading up to that event? Yeah, so we might. So uh, let's say uh, 40K TT, let's say that, you know, headwind one way, tailwind in another direction. Um, or, you know, some, some climbs or some rollers. Um, obviously, if it's slower speeds, you know, you get more bang for your buck in terms of power output. So if you're going up a, up a climb, it's actually a little bit better to push on there because obviously, you know, you're not, um, you're overcoming gravity rather than, rather than uh, wind resistance to, to a bigger degree. Therefore, you know, that scales linearly uh, rather than quadratically like uh, air resistance does. So, you know, I might get athletes to go out and find a similar course near their home and we practice that, you know, let's do, let's break it down. Rather than doing 40, you know, K in one go, let's do blocks of 5K, for example, and let's practice that, you know, pushing on up those rises and then, you know, easing back a little bit on the on the descent afterwards, for example. Um, and one thing I, quite, I get riders to do is to pick a point. So, you know, point to point and repeat that point, and repeat that section of, of, the, of, of the course over and over and get a feel for, you know, how can I maximize my speed by minimizing my wattage? So it might be the position slightly different on the on the downhill, for example, or uh, do they stay on the on the ball, you know, do they stay on the extensions or do they go to, you know, the bullhorns? And get a feel for what works and what in what kind of you know circumstances. And having a section where you kind of repeat it over and over and over allows you to make those kind of direct comparisons much easier. Yeah, makes sense. Also uh, regarding best bike split, so I also 
have used it quite a bit and I tend to agree that the the power plan that you get is is a very good starting point what uh, what I've struggled with to be honest is that I don't really I haven't seen the the time prediction the pr- predictions being very accurate I think it tends to kind of overestimate the speed you get for the power in the real world is this something you've seen uh, or if not uh, perhaps can you explain how you make that uh, speed prediction uh, more accurate than what I've seen yeah I think uh, obviously you know I think there's, there's a lot of factors that you're guessing at whenever you you know these models work but the data that you're putting into them potentially isn't accurate. So, you know, you're estimating a rolling resistance, you're estimating an air pressure based on, you know, weather report, you're estimating wind speed, all those things. So there's a lot of factors in there that, yes, they're accounted for in the model, but the data you're putting into that model isn't great. It's just, it's just a very rough estimate. And that's where you see this discrepancy between, you know, the, the time that it says you might finish an event in and the time you actually finish an event in. And, and in certain circumstances, I you know, my experience is it can actually go either way. Um, so I think understanding that's a really important part. So, you know, like with your, with athletes, I say, you know, this is just a model. It is just a prediction. You know, it's not defining your performance within this event. It's just predicting what it might be. Um, therefore, don't get too hung up on, you know, if the prediction is not quite perfect. All it's doing, all it is, is a tool to allow us to come up with a good pacing strategy and give us a good starting point on that. Don't be defined by whatever best bike split or, or any model that you use um, is saying. That's just a model to, to kind of help us make decisions rather than to, to kind of live or die by. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what, one of the main uh, impacting factors there is the estimate for the CDA, because as you said, uh, the, uh, that power scales uh, quadratically with, uh, with the air resistance. Uh, so, uh, so that's one of the main factors. Rolling resistance, of course, has uh, significant uh, impact as well, but it's uh, not as big as the CDA. So, uh, I guess just to get some idea for myself and for listeners, how do you you have some riders, obviously, that you have had in the wind tunnel, so maybe then it's easy to just plug their CDA in. Best Bike Split also have their uh, race analysis, I think they call it, so you can uh, you can choose a workout file or a previous race and best by speed will analyze and calculate your cda based on that file which is what i've tended to use most often to get uh, as good a cda estimate as i can but uh, yeah what would you say if you don't have wind tunnel data uh, is the preferred way to estimate cda for the input to the model yeah, I think CDA is a bit of a funny one. So people get very hung up on what your CDA is, and obviously it is very important. However, any estimate that you're making of CDA is only an estimate in a you know a given set of circumstances. So even if you have people in the wind tunnel, you, you see a variance in how well they can take that position in the wind tunnel and apply it to the real world and hold it in the real world and and, and how stable it is in the real world. So I think what rather than uh, just a point on cda so rather than trying to you know chase a number or this is what it is at whatever estimate you're using all you're trying to do is reduce it and you know that's more error if that makes sense you, you're not too worried about if your estimate's coming out too high or too low what you're trying to do is reduce it at all times i think the, you know there's tools out there so um there's things like uh there's a website called gribble.org i believe there's uh, golden cheetah have their aero lab which i think there's a new version of coming as well like you say there's there's the um the, the system within best bike split to predict you know you, you can always try and use a couple of these tools and, and get a bit of an estimate you know like an average between them is it, probably a good way rather than relying on one tool um but i think you just have to take that inherently with a, a with a bit of pinch of salt so you know, if, if the wind swings around and it's, it's you know, it's a higher your angle than you were expecting, for example, that's going to change your change your CDA. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't don't invest too much in these models, if that makes sense. You know that their models are there to help, but, you know, they, they don't have to be perfect. They're just there to inform the decision making. Yeah, no, sure. That makes sense. And going back to the topic again on coaching and evidence-informed coaching that we talked about at the beginning, uh, I want to ask what's one area of uh, sports science that you are currently learning more about and uh, that you're interested in? What's, yeah, what's fascinating you at the moment? Okay, so um, 
I'm lucky enough, we've just had two papers accepted and we're, we're about to submit a third paper. So uh, recently I've been looking at work in uh, under 23 cyclists. So first of all, we did a longitudinal study across an entire season uh, where we tested cyclists uh, it, uh, in pre-season at their training camp. And then we looked at their power files throughout the entire season and looked at changes in performance. Um, and essentially saw that actually performance is relatively stable across an entire season. Um, so it's kind of important where you where you come into the season. If you come in behind the curve, you, you're pretty much going to stay behind the curve. If you come in, you know, ahead of the curve, you, you know, you're going to perform well for for most of the season. Um, so that's one paper that we just had accepted. Um, and then the second paper, as I touched on earlier, so we're looking at performance in the Tour of the Alps between under 23s and and um, and professional cyclists, and also between different rider categories, and looking at you know how they perform after given workloads. Um, and that kind of leads quite nicely into my PhD, which you've been looking at, can we can we understand that that kind of downward shift in the power duration curve? Can we predict it? So at the moment, obviously, the only way we have to kind of predict it is to you know, have a cyclist go out and do a lot of work and then test them again. But obviously, that's not that feasible or applicable in, in the real world when we're, when we're testing athletes. Um, so can we predict that from fresh tests? Um, what are the factors that are you know, involved in that? Um, it's obviously a multifaceted, you know, kind of um, thing. So, you know, there's going to be a lot involved there. But, you know, can we pin it down to this is this seems to be the main cause? Um, and also how if we know if we know what the main cause is and we, we can predict it, can we can we then improve it uh, and, you know, come come up with interventions with athletes that are designed to, you know, uh, designed to basically make them more fatigue resistant? Um, I guess it's probably the best way to to, to phrase it. Um, so that's my current kind of interest from a, from a research and, and sports science uh, side of things. Perfect. And let's uh, tackle a couple of a few topics here where you can give just some uh, shorter, quicker take home messages, thoughts, or ideas. And uh, let's start with training with heart rate, power, and RPE. And uh, by the way, I should put a disclaimer here. If you have a lot to say about this, then they don't have to be short. We'll, we'll just okay. go deeper into, into it. But from the from the outset, it's okay to just give like the the high-level takeaway. Okay. Uh, use all three. Each one tells you something different. So people forget about RPE. They don't use RPE enough. RPE tells you lots of interesting things. Um, so one thing I do with athletes is, obviously, I, I talked about the testing, you know, the kind of the monitoring I do with the five-minute test earlier that obviously includes RPE but I also use um, something called the Lambert's and Lambert's of maximal cycling test um, and that that has all three and, and the dynamics of change in, in each of those three tells you a lot about um, how an athlete is responding and what sort of state of fatigue they're in so use all three and compare them to one another training intensity distribution um, polarize is my go-to to start with any athlete so I think that's probably, you know, from, from the evidence base is, is probably the way to start. Uh, but be flexible and not too dogmatic about things. It, you know, if something happens to work for uh, an individual athlete, um, but it's not, you know, it's not reflected in the scientific literature, there, there will be a reason why that is. Um, but, but don't fight that too much and, and go with what seems to work with, with that athlete. Um, don't also get too bogged down in only physiological changes so for example some some athletes get a lot of enjoyment and they get a lot of um confidence i guess from being able to perform in you know like those long hard typical sort of tempo or sweet spot uh, sessions if that makes sense and actually come out of those sessions with, oh, i'm going really well and probably that that boost in in uh in sort of confidence coming out of that session is probably worth more to you than than any slight changes in the in the physiology from between that session and having done you know sort of a more polarized approach um so look at it a bit more holistically than than getting too bogged down in in one approach versus the other mm, that's a great point and uh, rest and recovery uh underpins everything and i think throw nutrition in there as well so if you're getting those things wrong, you, you you just not uh you just won't be responding and adapting to training as as best you can. Um, you know they're not they're not going to make an average athlete elite, but they can make an elite uh, uh, an elite athlete very average if you don't get those things right. So they underpin everything, and I think coaches need to spend more time working on rest and recovery, nutrition, 
with with athletes than than purely setting you know training sessions what are some key things that you advise your athletes on in in this realm uh, some and some things that you see that athletes might often get uh, wrong unless they get this advice uh sleeping so people don't really sleep enough so you, you know athletes need i think there's, there's a paper out there that says if you know if athletes aren't getting seven and a half hours or more a night then then they're 50 percent more likely to to come down with illness um which is huge so you know sleeping is is one of the key things that athletes need to do more of athletes probably don't uh use napping enough um or or don't do it perfectly so it then interferes with nighttime sleeping um so that's a that's kind of a big avenue for potential gains with with athletes um, on the nutrition side of things, the kind of mantra that we use is, is kind of fuel for the for the work required. So you know, what is your next train? What are you trying to recover from? And what's your next training session? And fuel accordingly. You know, if you've just done a hard training session, obviously you need to kind of, uh, you know, you need to restore those glycogen stores, and you need kind of protein to recover from it. So they're your two kind of keys for your next meal. But what is what is coming up up after that? You know, if it's another hard. It, effort then you obviously you're going to need to really up your carb intake if it's just a recovery ride you're only looking for carbs to, to replace what you've what you've just done um one thing that's we do with athletes is we have like a, a traffic light system so tim who i mentioned earlier um essentially once i've kind of set a training for an athlete uh and he, we've spoke about okay what the goals for this for this training block um he'll go in and actually create like a traffic light system of of carbohydrate and protein intake for athletes so greens obviously a lot and reds reds not much and oranges your average sort of day um and then we adjust those to to kind of um maximize adaptations to, to each uh, exercise and prepare athletes for the next next upcoming session yep and uh strength and conditioning um pretty fundamental nowadays i think you know there's enough research out there that says you know athletes need to be strong to be to perform well um and, you know even just for injury prevention and, and kind of general health point of view i think it's really important um i've had a rider once get injured because they tried to pick up their bag at an airport on the way to a training camp right and that's like you know that was a week of training down the, down the drain um so even for little things like that athletes need to be strong um so that's kind of on a general sort of conditioning level i think that's really important um if you're looking for performance gains through strength and conditioning i think that they are there to be had but the programming of that strength and conditioning needs to be really carefully considered and there's some really good papers out there on, on kind of how uh, the interference effect and the crossover effect between strength work and uh, sort of uh, work on the bike or or running work and how you know you need to program those two things so quite it takes a lot of time and effort to get strength and conditioning integrated into a program in an effective manner mm. uh, would uh, would you uh, advise doing some sort of like high weight uh, low rep uh, program if that if performance gains are on the bike or what you're after uh, would you consider the the explosiveness the speed of the movement and and in terms of if the focus is more on just a general being generally strong so that you don't get injured and such uh, would that look differently would it be more functional strength training or well functional is a bit of a buzzword i guess but bo body weight um uh, etc can you give some some more information around that yes yeah, so i think all my athletes have a kind of a body weight program that they do um even if we don't have any specific strength and conditioning work in there they'll all have a body weight session that they do and and then the athletes that have a, a more kind of tailored to strength and conditioning program will use that body weight session as their warm up essentially. Um, I think this is getting a little bit outside of my kind of area of expertise. So I'm, I'm more of a physiologist than a kind of a biomechanist or, a, or you know, my knowledge isn't in, uh, in strength and conditioning. I actually work with a guy called Hamish, um, Hamish Monroe, who's, who's a strength and conditioning coach on that side of things. So, but I think rate of movement is an, an underutilized tool. Um, especially, you know, they, the rate of movement needs to be matched to, you know, whatever your, whatever that event is. So if you're looking at, you know, track sprinting, I think, you know, you'd obviously need some very high speed movements in there. Um, and what you don't want to do is, you know, go heavy with your, with your gym work, for example, and, and actually end up, you know, with riders that can produce a lot of force, but, but not potentially a lot of power because they can't 
produce that force quick enough. Um, so yeah, I think focus just as much on on the rate of movement as you do on the reps and, and sets and that sort of stuff. Mm, yeah, interesting. All right, and let's move on to the rapid fire questions. And these are rapid fire, so just uh, one sentence. And the first one is: What's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? Uh, Endure by uh, Alex Hutchinson. And what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? I must don't have one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Nothing. All right. And what's the personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Um, whenever I'm stuck on a problem, I put it down and go out for a run or a bike ride or a ski or a climb or something, and then come back to it feeling fresh again. And normally you've come up with a new approach or new idea or new way of tackling that problem by the time you get home. Yeah, that's superb. Like it. All right. So, and finally tell the listeners, where can they find out more about you? Where can I follow you? And so on. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I'm on Twitter, spread underscore coaching. Um, or you can get me on my website, which is spikecyclecoaching.com. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, James, for taking the time to come on the podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk to you again soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Speak to you soon. I hope that you enjoyed that interview with uh, Coach James Prague. As usual, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com. On Thursday, we have another Q&A episode coming out. And then next Monday, I interview Dr. Bob Murray on glycogen metabolism and resynthesis, which is a fascinating episode and a topic that I've recently been researching and reading about myself a lot, which is actually how I found, found Dr. Murray and invited him on as a guest. So uh, yeah, expect a really, really good episode. Uh, I was uh, really, really glad to get Dr. Murray on and he turned out to be an exceptional, exceptionally well-spoken guest, I should say. So definitely one not to miss. If you're looking for training plans, coaching services, uh, or similar, then we offer those kinds of products and services on scientifictriathlon.com. Super high quality. Uh, go check it out. You won't be disappointed. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take the free online sweat test to get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15% off your electrolyte products with the promo code that triathlon show 15 and thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft. Bombs.